Yes, we're back with another guest. We have Mr. Montrose, Terry Masson, who's from our broth. Uh, Terry has played for Montrose FC for 10 years and is considered a legend at the club. Terry, thanks for joining us. How are you? How's the family? Yeah, family's good. I um, think I'm getting on okay with lockdown. I think we're in week nine now. Uh, I've done all my jobs, so just stitching to get back playing football, back to work, back to normality. You had a list of jobs to do? Um, yeah, my garden was not as it looks just now, so I've done a bit of work to that. And yeah, just trying to do jobs to keep busy, to be honest. I think that's where I've gone wrong. I haven't had a list of jobs to do at all. I've just kind of made it up as, as I, you. I went along. <laughs> yeah. um, you mentioned it there, but obviously you're missing football loads. Yeah, I think just being around the boys, when you're away from the club, you're not getting little things like you just chatting about football. So this would be great, just half an hour speaking about football, really. <laughs> uh, Montrose were on a really decent run again in the playoff pictures. Um, you must have been gutted that the season stopped when it did. You must have given yourself a good chance of getting into those playoffs and then having to go at the, the the playoffs and getting into the championship again. Yeah, I think we were just starting to hit a good run of form. We obviously had a bit of a slow start this season. Uh, I, don't, I don't think we picked up a single point the first six or seven games. And then just as the... The, well, just as the pandemic hit sort of thing, we had a, a little run of fixtures playing sort of Saturday, Tuesday, and we, we picked up a lot of points and we just obviously went into the, the final playoff spot again. So we were in a really good position with six games going. So, yeah, it's a bit disappointing that it obviously finished that way, but it's just one of these things. Does that give you a bit of motivation again to go again next season? Um, yeah, I think, was, I think we're always quietly confident at the start of the season we never have too high expectations you know it's, it's securing our position in the league then we sort of make little targets looking towards the playoffs and we, we managed to do that the last two seasons so uh, I think that will be the main aim again next year uh, looking at safety then, then trying to build on uh, what we've done the last couple of seasons but I think we're an established league one side now you know we, we pick up points on the road and at home so um, I think that's got to be the aim again next season. Must be a a good bunch of bunch of lads at Montrose and a decent dressing room because there are some big clubs in that division and you've more than held your own. Uh, this is only the second season, isn't it, in League One? Um, and last season you got into the playoff picture, and this season you were there again. So that a, a large part of that must be down to the dressing room and the and the gaffer. Yeah. yeah, I think a massive attribute that we have at the club is our togetherness. Like it's been much the same group of players for a number of years now which I think has helped massively and um, just knowing each other's strengths and we all get along great and I think the manager's obviously added a bit of quality each year so I think we're probably as strong a squad now as, as we've had but that sort of togetherness has, has remained a feature of the team. That's great we'll, we'll come back to Montrose Terry I'm interested yeah. Obviously, a lot of kids come to 360 TFT and they've not been playing football for a while. So I'm interested in how you got started in, in football. Um, you're from Arbroath, aren't you? Yeah, from Arbroath. So um, as a young boy, all the, the clubs that I played for were local teams. So just really my whole life, all I can remember is, is playing football. I was sort of brought up in the as a Rangers fan in the 9 a row era. So uh, I was just obsessed with football, with Rangers. Like, I wanted to be... The, the next Barry Ferguson, the next Paul Gascoigne. So I was just one of the boys that was always playing football, always in a Rangers kit. Um, I think the early days I, I played for St Murdoch's. I don't know if they still exist in the town yeah. now. But basically, I probably started playing from about six years old and uh, my dad decided to put me there because they probably weren't as strong as other teams in the town at that point. But it meant that I could actually get a game at the weekend rather than just training. So I played with them for a couple of years, um, not having too much success, to be honest, just really uh, getting that opportunity to play with older boys. And then I uh, moved across to the Lads Club when I was nine years old. And I had a couple of couple of seasons there. We had a really good team, actually. We won a few things. And then um, I think, like like most players who are pretty good from the area, I moved on to, to sort of train with Dundee and Dundee United. See, when you were younger and you said... You obviously remember you weren't having a great time results-wise. 
with the uh, with St. Murdoch's. Did you care about that when you were younger? Did you just just want to play? You didn't care about the results. Yeah, yeah, you just want to have some fun. All. Yeah, I didn't I didn't really see football as going along to practice or something. It was really just playing. And I, I actually loved playing with with the older boys, you know, like trying to challenge yourself against older players and yeah. And once you realise you were maybe a little bit better than players one or two years older than you and get respect for them, that was that was the big thing that I liked at that age. Um, just getting along and playing against the older boys. Um, I liked how you uh, named a couple of role models there, Barry Ferguson and Gascoigne. I hope they were just role models on the park and not off the park. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, so when you were younger, at that age, I always ask this, but... Did you just practice at practice or were you out all the time with the ball, playing in the street, playing in the park, playing with your mates? Um, I, I do remember spending time by myself practicing maybe when, when kids were inside playing computers and stuff. I was never one to own a computer or that, but I think most of my football uh, when I was young was with my dad. I mean, he was probably my biggest influence and he gave up a lot of time just to help me practice, travel me to games and stuff. So I think my earliest memories of going down the park and playing with him, he would just come up with stupid little challenges for me to do, like, you know, headers, volleys, hitting off the crossbar, maybe like get the two touch and stuff. So uh, he really encouraged me to get involved in it. And then I probably played more so with my friends. I don't think you see it as much now, but you know, the sort of jumpers for goalposts and that one person that was your friend that had the football net and you always just set it up at the goal and everyone just knew to come along and play. I think... Mainly it was it was with my friends, not maybe not my age, but just always playing with people who were nearby. Um, but I did I did obviously practice myself. I do remember uh, being out the back garden doing TP ups, or uh, I used to have a garage just along from my house where it was in the winter where I could practice under the streetlight. But um, mainly with just with groups of boys that were all into football at that stage. That's great. See, obviously, we're in lockdown and I've received hundreds of clips from parents who are practicing with their kids. And it's amazing how parents can become football coaches. I mean, it's, I think yeah. football, I personally think football coaches are overrated a little bit. You know, it's up to the, the kids to practice. But see, the clips that I've received, there's some like ingenious little drills that parents have come up with. And you mentioned there, two touch, hitting the crossbar and things like that. Stuff yeah. like that keeps you engaged in football, doesn't it? At a younger age. Yeah, I think it could be as simple as that, you know, those stupid little practices that I, I spoke about my, my dad doing with me. I think sometimes just now players are overcoached, if you like. I think, no disrespect, but I think a lot of coaches maybe are online, see a lot of drills and stuff, maybe try and overcomplicate things for young kids. Where it, it could just be as simple as a practice that allows them to score a goal and that's enough for them to enjoy it, to be hooked and to want to come back, you know? Yeah, I I don't disagree with you at all. I think when I started coaching uh, quite a while ago, you know, I had hundreds and thousands of drills that I yeah. saw online, and you know, you would try and copy stuff. Now I've got maybe twenty, and you just put conditions yeah. within those drills. And I think as you yeah. mature as a coach and and you get more knowledgeable, I think you do actually realise that you don't need a hundred million drills, and you don't need gigabytes yeah. worth of stuff on your computer. You just need the basics that teach the basics and then give the kids a platform to go forward. So I don't disagree with you. They are overcoached a little bit. I'm pretty guilty of that myself. But that's interesting to, to hear from your point of view because obviously at Montrose you've got a pro youth set up there. Do you ever get involved with, with that, go along to any of the sessions and help out with that? Um, I don't go along to the sessions uh, myself because, well, they, I think they still train in Montrose. We train in Perth. But right. they have tried to use where a couple of the players come up every week and train with us guys um, and some of the players that have been coming up are, are excellent I think that I think the youth development there has improved massively in the time that I've been at Montrose um, I don't know what age group and stuff but they, they have had a bit of success I think last year one of the teams won the league um, so there are good players locally now and I, I think um, they've got a few age groups now it's, it's much bigger than it was certainly 10 years ago I think uh, Montrose as a club, obviously, with the community trust and things like that, are making great strides um, yeah. just for the whole town. And there's people from Arbroath that go through to Montrose, obviously, uh, pro youth level and things like that. I think it's been really good. It must be enjoyable to be part of that whole atmosphere at the moment at, at Montrose. 
Yeah, I think, it, like you say, the, the club is, is going places, certainly with the, the community trust and stuff, that's thought of as one of the best um, in the country. And I think it has changed in the 10 years that I've been there. Like, when I first arrived at Montrose, we were sort of a club that was known to be down the bottom of the league. Um, and, and that's not the case on the park. Now. So I think they're getting it right in most areas, you know, on and off the park. So it's, it's a really good time to be at Montrose. It's good to encourage that pathway from a young age group to the to the first team. I think that gives yeah. kids real focus and a goal to aim towards, doesn't it? Yeah, and I mean, there's, there's been very few players who have actually made the step youth to, to sort of first team at Montrose. But I think now that they can see that they're coming up to train and there is a much clearer pathway and they're getting the opportunity, it's probably a more attractive club to come to to be a youth player now. Yeah, that's that's a it's a great thing for the not just Montrose but the whole the whole of Angus that you can get players coming from Arbroath or for Brecon. Um, I don't know if you've got any players that come along, but there's that opportunity now to to do that. Yeah, it's a great thing. Terry, let's rewind a little bit back to after Lads Club. I think was it. So did you go to Dundee or Dundee United first? How did you get spotted by by those? Guys? Um, I was well, like I said, I went to Lads Club and I was about nine. Played there for uh, up until. They moved to 11 a side. So I think I was 12 year old, but kind of under 11s, under 12s, I was training with both Dundee and Dundee United. So I was probably training every night of the week and it was probably too much, if I'm honest. And then at 12 year old, I had a decision to make um, which one of them to sign for. And I chose Dundee United just purely because they were the better team <laughs> um, at that age group. And I just thought it was a better setup for me. So I chose to sign an S form with uh, Dundee United when I was 12 and I stayed there until I was 16. See, when you say it's too much, did you just mean it was too much? The training was too much or the travelling was too much or it was a combination of everything? Because it's quite young to be doing that, playing football every night yeah. of the week, isn't it? A, a, a bit of both. Uh, like you say, travel was one of them. I think um, I used to be on a Monday, Wednesday, I trained with Dundee United and they were slightly earlier. So I used to go, I used to get picked up straight from school my dad would, would take me through to Dundee uh, without having had anything to eat or anything, train, and then, then come back. And then the Tuesday, Thursday was the same with Dundee. Uh, although they trained slightly later, I managed to get home and get something to eat before I went. But then at that point, I was still playing with my Sunday boys club. So we would train a Friday night. Then on the Saturday, I would have some weeks, I would have a game with either Dundee or Dundee United. And then the Sunday, I'd have my normal boys club team. So... Almost every day of the week, you're you're training or playing, um, and it's a lot. It's a lot to ask of your your parents, and um, it was just probably too much at that stage. Those couple of years, I, I thought. And did you play for your school as well? Because that just lumps it on top, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, I I played I played all the time for my primary school, but uh, once I moved into secondary, um, probably less. So I remember playing a handful of games, but. Um, no, I kind of didn't really play at secondary level for my school. See, you mentioned you played for your boys club, Dundee and Dundee United, but was that because you weren't of an age that you could sign an S form yet? Is that why they let yeah, you do that? I think, yeah, I, I don't know if it's changed now, but um, at, at that time, I think the first sort of contract you could sign with uh, a club was your S form, and that couldn't be till you were 12 years old. So um, before then, a lot of the clubs would, would get you in. Um, into their setup, just have you training with them, I think, and hope that you would obviously go on to, to sign for them once you were 12 year old. And uh, so you were at United for four years? Is yeah. Right? Yeah. How was, the, how was the training there? What was the, what was the standard like? Yeah, so I, I really enjoyed my time um, at Dundee United, just kind of fizzled out towards the end, but I don't, I think their setup's maybe a little bit different now, but when I was there, we had um, a group of players from sort of Dundee and surrounding area, and then a big chunk of the players were West Coast. So the, the head of youth at that time was a guy called Graham Livingston. So a lot of the players that we had were, were West Coast players. So we wouldn't have had enough players of, of my age group just to train alone. So we used to train as probably from under 12s to under 16s all together. Um, so mainly just sort of skill development stuff. Uh, it was before the sort of box soccer stuff, so it was it was kind of like old pros that, that we had come to coach us. So I remember like Dave Bowman, uh, Willie Pettigrew, 
folk like that, so really knowledgeable people and, and ex-players. But I think the main thing for me was that you were playing against older players. It wasn't easy. You know, if you were your, your first year as a 12-year-old playing against a 16-year-old, it, it, was, it was really hard to begin with. Yeah, I mean, there must have been a good knowledge there in that coaching staff, a good playing knowledge. Yeah, um, so it would have been quite easy for you to pick up some stuff. Was the was the training more technical, tactical, physical? Was it a mix of all three? Was it did it change as the as you progress through the age groups? What kind of training did you actually get? Yeah, I don't I don't remember it being um, too tactical. Certainly for training, we might touch a bit on it on on the weekend, but just really about developing your skills. So um, you would all work on individual stuff like dribbling, you know, using both sides of your feet, little um, practices that, that coaches had probably done for a number of years. And then you, at the end, you would all play together as a game. So I can't really remember the, the sort of content of the, the sessions, but I imagine it was, it was mainly, you know, technical. I, think, I don't think there was too much emphasis at that stage on physical stuff. Um, and I don't remember ever being coached too much tactically during the week. Uh, what about the intensity? Was every training session really intense, 100%? Did you have to work Sorry, hard? That just, Sorry, that just broke up a little bit. That's okay. What's, what about the intensity of the, the training sessions? Was it 100% every session? Uh, did you have to work hard every session? Yeah, I think like like I say, those ex players like Dave Bowman, like really demanding characters. You know, I some on occasions had a silly head on that. Just it, it wasn't allowed. That was a big difference, obviously, moving from from boys club to a professional setup. Like you, you do have to be on it. You need to take it seriously and, and make sure that you're paying attention. You know, if if you're one of those boys that's going to be mucking about and, and not listening when you should be, there's <laughs> your, your space will be taken very quickly, you know? Yeah, I was up at the GA Arena uh, a few months back and the United Youth were training. What struck me was that as soon as the ball went out, another one was fired in straight away. You couldn't switch off. You couldn't take a breather. Yeah. It was really, really intense. And that, that was the biggest thing for me. It was the difference between sort of grassroots level and that pro youth level. Did you find that step up? Difficult, easy? Did you? Can you not remember it being a being a challenge? No, I, my first few years, I remember thinking that I was one of the better players in the age group. I didn't, I didn't find it overly difficult um, at all. But I think as I, I moved through the age groups, I began to find it uh, more and more difficult. I think um, boys physically developed a little bit more than me, and that was probably the main. Um, challenge for me, I've always been a little bit smaller than most, and it, it, that might be different now. But I think there was a lot of emphasis on your build and, and your height at that stage. So I found myself maybe getting moved from what I would see as my natural position, centre midfield, to to playing wide midfield or playing fullback. And it was at that stage I began to get a little bit frustrated and maybe just didn't enjoy my time. Um, at Dundee United as, as much as I did initially. Yeah. Was there anyone in that youth setup with you that, that's gone on to, to have a, a good career that we would know? Yeah, there's a handful of players um, have went on, well, certainly got the full-time contract and have done really well. So Kevin McDonald, who he, he actually broke through at Dundee, but he was in my year group at uh, Dundee United. Uh, Greg Cameron, he... Yeah. Also played a, a few years for them. And then Gary Kenneth was a year above. And there, there was loads of players around my age, um, like Goodwill, who was a year below. Um, and United was renowned at that stage for bringing through youth. So there was, there was a lot of players. And you thought it would be as good a club as any to, to get an opportunity. And good to, a good grounding in, in, from coaching point of view and the requirements needed to make it professionally, I'm guessing, as well just with yeah, the coaches yeah. and everyone else that had made it. Um, and then on to Dundee, is that right? Yeah, so we basically got, got to a stage under 16s where um, we went through a couple of managers in a short space of time and I didn't feel that they knew me as well as they could have and I probably wasn't playing. I was getting frustrated at that point. I wasn't enjoying it, so I spoke to my dad and said, not enjoying it, thinking about leaving and he sought an agreement that um, 
and maybe I had to go somewhere else just to, to get and join it again. So spoke with Dun United, just explained the situation and uh, managed to get away. And then I went over to to sign with Dundee for a year. Um, and that was sort of at the stage where um, they, were, they were in financial difficulty. And I don't think there was many youth players getting contracts. And I think it probably worked against me, um, having only been there for a year. And I wasn't actually offered um, a full-time contract. So it was at that stage, sort of 17, that um, I left Dundee and thought um, maybe my opportunity to play professional had maybe gone. So, see, when you when you moved from Dundee United to Dundee, was Dundee United obviously had to release you, and then Dundee had to sign you. Did you do that yourself with your dad? Did you have an agent? What was the what was the process behind that? Yeah, I think um, we still obviously because we're from the, the they play in the same city, and you know a lot of their players. I think the coaches knew that I wasn't enjoying it at Dundee United. Um, and my dad, having spoke to them, um, they said uh, if, if I was to get away, then the opportunity would be there to join Dundee. So uh, without making it too clear to Dundee United, that was always my plan. Um, and obviously once I managed to get freed, um, my dad had already spoke to the, the coach at Dundee and they were keen to get me back. So um, it worked out quite well in that, in that case. Good stuff. Um, and after that, did you go down to, to Arbroath, back to the hometown club? Yeah, so... Once, once I left Dundee, I didn't actually know uh, where I was going to play. I just uh, I took a few games playing with Arbor Vic, so I was really, I was really young at that stage, you know, seventeen year old playing junior football. But um, I didn't know where I was going to go, and I just played a couple of games at junior. And then uh, Mike Cavill, who was a coach at Arbor at the time, asked if I wanted to to come along to Arbor Youths, and I wasn't overly keen to start with, to be honest. I was. I was maybe thinking I was going to go and play junior, but I'm, I'm glad that I went and had another year of youth because it obviously worked out much better for me. And was that just in the, the youth team? Did you play many games for the first team? Yeah, so initially it was just with the youths and I went along, was was doing quite well and then kind of had the, the same sort of scenario as we do at Montrose. So you had the opportunity to go up and train with the first team as well as training with the, the youth. So I was doing that. Um, for my first year at Arbroath and then I only played a year I think at youth level and then I was sort of involved in the first team um, so I was at Arbroath for a few years probably not playing as much um, as I could have done uh, I think over three years I only ended up playing like 30 odd games so probably look back on that thinking it wasn't actually a very successful period for me. But was that your first experience of um men's the men's game getting involved in actual games where you know you had to win for the points and it meant yeah. something was that yeah. invalu- was that invaluable for you i know you didn't play many you say you didn't play many games but 30 games is quite decent but was that yeah, invaluable I mean, for your experience oh definitely i mean even going up um, just training during the week with them the difference between senior football and youth football is is massive and i know you've said about having to win the points and and whatever but just the demands that they're asking of you is is totally different than you would get from your peers sort of your age and it, it is it's a big change it's hard when you first try and make that breakthrough and um, I think it's really difficult for young players and um, when you first go up to play with the youth just because of the intensity and the, the fitness and stuff is so far superior to, to youth level see at youth level did you think you were fit and then you made that step up and you thought i have to go to another level again here or did you just sort of because i've watched you play quite a few times and you are you're hard working look quite fit especially for the level of football um have you always been like that did that help you when you stepped up or did you have to go to another level physically yeah no i mean i think when i was a, a youth player i probably didn't look after myself as as well as i do now and i i did consider myself to be quite fit but i think I'm much more knowledgeable now about how to look after myself and I don't think there was much of an emphasis on that when I was coming through, like not overly, or there wasn't overly an emphasis on strength and conditioning, nutrition or stuff and I think we're a lot more, we're much more aware of that now and um, I think that's obviously helped improve my fitness over the years. So I think I'm probably in as good a condition now as I've, I've ever been in my career but had I had that knowledge 
um, early in my career, I probably would have given myself a better opportunity. I think kids have got a great opportunity these days, depending on their age, obviously, with the internet of finding out all of this stuff, you know, nutrition, um, diet, um, any exercise they can do and things like that. It's probably, yeah. they've got a great opportunity to, to get that knowledge um, and make the best of themselves that they can be, I think. Um, back, when, back when we were young, there was hardly anything like that. Ah, there wasn't at all. Yeah, get a book from the library or something, that's how old <laughs> I am. Um, so after Arbroath, was it Forfar? Am I right? Wait, no. No. After after Arbroath, I actually I was sold to Cornishty Um I played six months there, and then uh, Brecon City came in to to try and get me on loan. So I ended up signing for them for half a season. We actually done really well. We got to the playoffs that year under Jim Duffy, and then. He left and Jim Weir came in and he obviously didn't fancy me. So Stephen Tweed um, got in touch with Montrose and that's when I, I signed for Montrose. So sort of, I'm out of can you see Pam Muir for six months, uh, breaking for the second half of the season and then on to Montrose. Breaking for, for, wasn't even close. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then obviously uh, you end up at Montrose. Um, just why Montrose? Any reason? Just... Um, I think Paul Tosh was there at the time and had obviously played with him at Arbroath, so um, he spoke to Stephen Tweed, said a bit about me, um, and he obviously got in touch looking to bring me in. So I think that was the main reason that I ended up going to Montrose um, through Paul Tosh. And then at the same time, um, my friend Nicky Smith uh, also signed for them. So I had a couple of players from Arbroath. I knew a couple of players who were already there from the time at Dundee. So I felt like it would be a good place uh, to go, having known a few of the boys already. Ten years later, and it sounds like you made a good choice. Yeah, definitely. I think initially, like I said, it was obviously uh, quite difficult in terms of um, some of the results and stuff we had, but I, I've really enjoyed my time at Montrose. Um, I think when I signed, I never seen myself being here or being there for 10, 11 years, but it's gone so quickly. Like the season's just churn up. Yeah, I'll bet. Uh, so this season's obviously been cancelled. And um, how have you been keeping fit and active during the break? Is the club giving you some stuff? Or, I usually see you down at the local high school doing doing laps of the pitches there. I know you're uh, you quite active anyway. But see, during this yeah, I mean, period, yeah, has it changed? Yeah, no. I, I, during the season, I, I try and keep as fit as I can anyway. But I think. I'm quite old school in what I do, like you say, you've seen me running laps of the park. I, I go out running, road running, old school, four, four minutes, as much for my mental side as I do for my physical. You know, I like to get some miles under my belt, clear my head. So that's kind of what I've just been continuing to do. So I'm out running most days, uh, do a bit on the bike. And I've, I've had a go at turning my garage into a home gym. So I'm doing a little bit of that as well. But uh, just trying to keep myself as fit as possible. I didn't know when the season was brought to an end how long it was going to be for, so I was working hard to keep myself fit, and then obviously the longer it's gone on, um, the fitness will have started to deteriorate. But I'm trying to do as much as I can. I've obviously got a good bit of time on my hands, so there's there's no excuse why I shouldn't be uh, doing a little bit, you know? Are you going to have a, a pre-season? Are you going to have a little break, or are you just going to keep going through? Um. Usually, I would take a couple of weeks off as soon as the season finishes, but because I obviously didn't know when we were going back, if we were going back, I was just I kept training and probably expecting to be back within a few weeks. So I actually haven't really took much time off. Um, I've maybe sort of tapered down my training a little bit uh, recently, not doing as much, but um, I just tend to, to try and train through. I don't know if that's the... Uh, advice that people would be encouraging but I think just for myself like uh, I said sort of the mental side I, I like to to get out early mornings clear my head do a bit of running so uh, I think I'll just train right through to be honest. Um, have you been doing any work with the ball? Um, not really because like you said you usually see me at um, the high school playing fields we don't have access to that at the minute so um, I'm finding where I usually go to train I can't get to. I've been up to the academy playing fields, but that's not kept in as good as condition as the, the high school. So I've not done a great deal. I've been getting involved in 
a couple of the little challenges I've had nominations from friends and uh, I obviously work as a, a PE teacher so I've had to, to put out a couple of challenges for the kids to do so. The, the stuff I am doing is minimal, you know, it's in my back garden um, and <laughs> it probably wouldn't be considered training if you like. Yeah, you'll have to do one of our challenges. They're quite simple and straightforward. I'm sure you'll you'll be better at them than I am anyway. Yeah. Uh, I've seen I've, some, I've seen a couple of efforts from some of my friends. I can't be any worse than that. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure about that, but thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, so ten years of intros, obviously, it's been a real roller coaster. Um, in those ten years, you finished bottom of the league, the whole football league. Um, you become a league okay. champion. Uh, last season, you got into the playoffs. This season, you were in the, the playoff picture again. Uh, but surely, your biggest achievement, Terry, was scoring an overhead kick against Arbroath. Yeah, I mean, I don't think a lot of people remember that because it was obviously the day that he's won the league. So, um, I don't think it was actually a great goal, to be honest. There was no reason for me to overhead pick that. Probably could have just sighted the volley that was about two yards off the ground. But no, nah, it's probably one of my better goals, to be honest. I think yeah, you're understating it. It was a great goal. Um, it, yeah. wasn't two, it wasn't two yards off the ground. I remember <laughs> I was there that day. Um, in all seriousness, though, um, see, within the lower leagues in Scotland, I think it's quite rare. For someone to stay with the club for for ten years, yeah, you must you must really love it in Trows and you must love the club and the the atmosphere around the club. Yeah, like you said, when I signed eleven years ago, I, I didn't foresee me being at the the club uh, for this length of time. But I think sometimes you just find somewhere uh, where you're comfortable and and where the people appreciate you. And I think that that's kind of what's happened uh, to be at Montrose. I'm obviously working with a manager who. Uh, clearly likes me because I, I play most weeks and um, the sort of fans appreciate what I do. So I've never felt any reason to leave. Um, obviously, when we weren't having as much success in the early days, it was difficult. But we always had a good group of players, even when we weren't doing well. Like, if I remember back to my first few seasons, like we had some good players, good squad. Like we just we underachieved. There was there was weeks where we were capable of, where we were winning five 0 but the following week we were following up with a 5-0 defeat you know they were just we didn't have any sort of consistency because we had young boys and um, whereas now I think we've got a much more established team and a good group of senior players and because I've had I've been with them for a good few years now that they're, they're all close friends you know so I've, I've never felt any reason to leave and I've always had a sort of eye on the testimonial the, the closer it crept up so uh, that's something I've been working towards probably for the last four or five years. Is that this season or next season your testimonial? Yeah, well, it was actually supposed to be this season. Um, I, I basically signed a two-year deal so I could run my events um, over two years to avoid trying to cram them all into a season. So this was actually my 10th season that I've just completed. Um, and my events were supposed to start this season and run into next. So... I should have had a game in July, uh, which would have been a pre-season game, but that's obviously been affected. And then I'm still hoping that the, the dinner can run later in the year, but um, just really waiting on government guidance for that. It's yeah. not looking good just now. Yeah, it's not. Um, any exclusives, uh, exclusive sorry, on who you'll be playing in your testimonial game? Nah, I mean, not, we were in conversation with a club and quite advanced but nothing was confirmed and um, hopefully that could be a rearranged for a, a future date but nothing's been confirmed so I don't want to, to jinx it. <laughs> uh, hopefully it's a, a decent opposition and yeah. you get a big crowd yeah. along to show the opposition. Yeah. yeah. Um, have you given any thoughts uh, what you'll do after your playing career ends? It's maybe a bit early to be thinking about that now but... Yeah, I think... Initially, I would just like to spend a bit more time with my family. Like, you, you struggle to do that when you're working a full-time job and playing part-time, you know, uh, being out the door early morning some days and then, or every day and then some nights obviously not getting home till late. So I think initially the first few years I would like to just spend a little bit of time with the family. Through my job, um, I obviously have some coaching qualifications. So if I do think that... Uh, down the line, that's something that I'd like to do. Then um, I might, I might go into that. I've just become a qualified PT, so fitness-wise, that obviously gives me something else to look at. But 
just want to focus on playing just now. I think I've got another few years yet, so uh, yeah, just that just now, really. Yeah, those uh, those trips down to Stranraer and stuff must be a killer, especially when you yeah. work the full day and you've got a midweek fixture. Um, yeah, definitely are. I think, well, that was the last game that we actually played before the season was cut short. And um, it's fine when you win, but if you, you go down there and get a defeat midweek, there's, there's nothing worse. Okay. Listen, Terry, thank you very much for doing this. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. You've had a really interesting career. Um, a lot of inspiration there for young kids never to give up. You know, you've obviously went into the United system. It's not for you. Yeah. You went to Dundee. It's not for you. You went around a few other clubs and you found a club you stayed at for 10 years. It's, it's absolutely great to hear that. So thanks again. No problem. Okay. We'll catch you later. Bye. Yeah, thank you. Bye.